Hello again, uh, it's, it's me, JC. And I'm here doing my final project on music publishing, licensing and distribution as it relates to participatory culture. And uh, I'm gonna be talking a little bit about some of the um, ecology that stems as a result of how people participate in licensing, distribution, production, and the like. It's a participatory culture is a concept that I really grasped this semester and wanted to understand more about. And in this project, my intention is to show how sampling and licensing music libraries has become integral in participating within music distribution, not only in the form of sampling, but it's, you know, just creating in general, right? Um, that's, that's always been a part of it, but sampling is kind of a new addition to this, um, this predicated concept in, you know, that's regular in music notation. Um, and a lot of the, and I'm going to show how a lot of this is integral to uh, f other forms of production, such as uh, stock music for TV and film. Uh, to begin this discussion, I got to ensure that you all understand why sampling and remix has been allowed and is popularized by music distributors, and especially applications that are contextualized music where they want you to play with the music or get involved or cover the music um, to keep you engaged in the music. Uh, since the U.S. Copyright Office has declared fair use regulations that require transformative properties be applied to copyrighted music that's uh, included underneath the fair use standard, a lot of music producers and other content creators are benefiting from manufacturers' advances in music production technologies, as well as um, social media distribute or social media companies' um, ability to work with the copyright office and get certain content licensed on a uh, cons uh, use use-to-use use basis, um, or work directly with the rights holders. So it's a pretty interesting concept of remix culture today. We see it a lot on different social media platforms and of course in music. Sample packs are a definite result from this. If you have not seen those before, it's essentially where uh, somebody puts together a group of sounds that they made and they release it uh, either in the form of you know a track itself to be licensed or um, one shots and small loops and stuff that other producers could use to complement a whole composure or arrangement. Uh, it's a way to make a finished product, these sample packs. Of course, some producers can expect and require remixers to attribute them in um, when they use their sample packs or if they're licensing some of their content, you know, under com Creative Commons or another form of uh, cop. Um, uh, another form of license. Uh, so yeah, to start at the conception of a copyrighted work sampled and remixed, one has to be particular in finding works that can either be remixed to the point of transformation or obtain permission from the original rights holder to participate in the music licensing of today. Um, a first step in becoming a recognizable remix artist is to accomplish, you know, a nice sound in remixing. A lot of times you might just have access to remix this the original song pretty basic and there's no changes but a lot of times that's going to get you um infringed you're going to be infringing upon copyright if it's not uh, licensed to you in a particular manner uh, a lot of the technologies and um that have allowed these tra this transformative and sampling to take place has, has been popularized by alessis m audio akai which are underneath um in music as uh, as subsidiaries and uh, they produce product, music production licenses and music libraries for license as well. So uh, all this licensing is pretty important to remix culture. Uh, if we go back and we think of when you know Edison invented the phonograph, um, at the time it was all about selling uh, individual units, right? It started with here, here's a phonograph, or the next it was here's a vinyl, now a cassette or um, an eight track. And today, after the digital piracy revolution with involving plenty of companies that came after Napster, as well as you know the Pirate Bay and other BitTorrent services, we have this new access. A lot of streaming platforms really are just access-based music libraries. Um, and they're just services that um, have, were popularized because 
of this all access and a lot of a lot of these platforms uh, benefit from a, a freemium software. Uh, you know, think of Spotify, right? You the advertisers are paying the are out to the artists if you're listening for free. Whereas if you are subscribing to the software, the artists are getting paid based on how many people are actually subscribing. So, but that's collectively, um, and it also sometimes is based on local competition. And um, if somebody else is getting more streams in where you are as an artist, they're gonna get a little bit more pay um, because more listen people are listening in that area. There's more users listening to them. Um, so there's a whole different whole whole different competitive system uh, uh, that these access these new access based music services um, can develop right. So there's, there's a whole lot of competition for features on uh, you know just being able to share your your playlists um, and these features have helped these companies sort of diversify themselves and Spotify has st stood out from the pack a lot of the time. Um, a lot of the, uh, you know, music companies were struggling to make a profit during the time of uh, all this digital piracy and these access based companies were, were able to give them a footing and, and help them make a profit again. Although a lot of them, um, the access based companies are operating at a loss, surprisingly enough. Uh, because of the way that their revenue model is set up a lot, there's been a lot of argumentation whether this is actually good for the artists themselves um, who are participating in producing the music, getting it out there, promoting it um, alongside their record labels or doing it independently as is, is pretty common. You would expect these companies um, to want to you know, make a profit and they do. So they're, a lot of their revenue stream models are a little bit different. Um, but Spotify, as a specific example, there's been a lot of arguments that the uh, rights holders for music ha have had with Spotify due to their um, platform itself. And if you look at how people are taking this ability to listen to music, there's going to be um, people who want to continue to capitalize off that. And so these streaming companies are going to just basically going to have to develop into something more contextualized, right? These features uh, have to be, have to matter to people and they have to keep people engaged. So that's led to a, a lot of um, other types of uh, context-based music services like um, RJDJ, BandLab, Beatport, and, which are all, which are all examples of um, services in which the users themselves actually either create the content uh, using uh, licensed music libraries through the company that's hosting the application, um, or they just basically share like an, like an application called Smule where you can do a sort of a karaoke style of the songs that you want to. And um, this keeps people interested in the music itself because it's these, all these companies realize that that they have to offer something more than just accessibility to the music. They have to um, diversify their offerings to their consumers to be able to survive. And so other companies have uh, taken this step further and become more contextualized based services for users to play with music and interact with the music itself. So licensing, right? When Contextualized based music services want to get a free library from artists, right? Somebody has to produce the music that the users are either going to use, listen to, um, and, you know, have a fandom over or whatever. So there's a lot of music libraries that people, that musicians um, dedicate themselves to uploading to in order to turn a profit on, you know, send it, licensing their music for film, commercials, uh, television and the like and the like, or even radio, right? So um, websites uh, have been accumulating uh, different types of genres, and some people um, who are looking for maybe a more specific foothold in the music industry, like like I am, I'm I'm, I'm very interested in getting a, you know maybe a placement or a record deal or something like. Well, not maybe not a record deal, but a placement, um, you know, in television or um, 
working with a popular with an up and coming artist, right, to produce some some of the some of the background uh, beats for them, right? And so the whole this whole niche industry has developed where um, through through social media such as YouTube, Instagram, um, which and I've I've seen this develop uh, by following some of the creators that. Uh, have been recommended to me through the algorithm, um, and it's my it's basically a personalized algorithm that I I probably have developed. So a lot of people maybe don't see what I see, and I've been able to observe how uh, creators like Marlo Diggs has developed an entire you know almost just small catalog of vinyl cuts. Um, and you know distorted samples and his own creative uh, take on um, actually uh, copyrighted samples in some cases um, that to to the point where he can basically develop the sample pack, put it on the site called Bandcamp, and flip it for a couple bucks um, and make make a little bit of money outside of just distributing his music. And I've seen people like Stu Bangas do the same thing on a different scale where they're, they have their own website. They're distributing music through uh, Spotify and all that, of course, um, but also licensing sample packs and uh, drum collections and different types of uh, sa- different types of, you know, basically collectible items that um, you know, outside of just merchandise that other producers can use to participate in the music distribution culture. So it's kind of, they're kind of like feeding back in um, and use and offering music up and coming music producers uh, new to the new to the industry a chance to um, you know basically buy a non-exclusive license. Uh, a lot of exclusive licenses are reserved for sites like band uh, like uh, like BeatStars, right? where these you know some producers pay a premium fee to have their content posted um and uh have unlimited uploads and have very detailed and specific contracts that are actually uh set up through uh some of these music libraries one being beat stars um there's a couple others right like beatport they they do the same thing it's but it's specifically for edm music um another uh, sample pack, uh, light music li- or music library that licenses um, specifically hip hop is called the Drum Bright Drum Broker. They basically just it's like an invite only um, a music library network where all these producers come in and um, they just centralize all their content on one platform where they can uh, attract, where they can send all their listeners and attract more and more um and you basically get more engagement through through uh you know email campaigns and you know ads on instagram and basically reach more than just the sum of one creator's audience so it's a pretty smart it's it's a lot maybe what podcast networks do or radio networks do um so it's it's the same idea where you're aggregating all that and uh like I said, other places do the same thing, but for like beat poured and stuff. Um, and the other, and another great example of somebody who is licensing their content outside of the, uh, music industry, um, by just, you know, basically just creating songs and working with rappers and stuff is, uh, this guy named Jimmy black. Uh, I found him on Instagram and he does uh, a lot of work for Akai and basically does this kind of like self marketing for the company because he's so passionate about the products themselves. And you'll, I found that he's represented other brands, you know, at marketing and promotions like NAM, um, which was a, is basically a big event where all of these music manufacturers get together and showcase their newest products. And they bring on some of the most passionate users to demonstrate their new products. And so this guy, Jay black, uh, as, as his Instagram name, um, goes, um, uh, he, he basically is one of those guys that gets out there and, and light and just gets paid or volunteers somehow, or I'm not exactly sure, but 
he gets out there and is um, working with the with the manufacturers themselves in an event marketing role, um, sort of uh, quid pro quo, I guess, uh, between him and that of him and the manufacturers. So there's a lot of different ways that you can license your time in a way um, and license their, your content in the music industry. And it's all about participating and uh, drawing in new users who are also wanting to participate as in the case with these music libraries. You know, stock music libraries um, are really important for all types of industries and is a way to tell a story, which is what, of course, all of these people are um, trying to make with music right if you're attracting a rappers then you're trying to make a story um with the music right so that the rapper can tell the stories so you want to get them in that storytelling mode um there's a lot of a lot of ways to get the set the mood for music through license and make money through licensing so it's a really effective way of uh showcasing participatory culture and um you know it's engaging consumers and we to talk take on branded content. Uh, much of the content has been developed without sponsorship with that by manufacturers. But over time, uh, you know, like I was saying with Jay Black, many manufacturers have taken notice of some of these passionate users and brought them on at, to be their to be their promoters. And once again, uh, this is beneficial to both the marketer and the manufacturer when these partnerships are developed. These partners, these participants um, are in the marketplace of ideas and they can work together to better engage and meet the needs of consumers. Just wanted to let you guys know that I really enjoyed this class. Um, I learned a lot about more than just participatory culture, but I'm, I'm hoping that my focus on it has brought you some insight into what I learned in my readings. Uh, the purpose in this was to show how the manufacturers that take advantage in the development of their products themselves produce an ecosystem in the marketplace that grows through the acceptance of licensing, copyright transformation, and originality of today's legal infrastructure that surpasses much conflict in the history of music distribution. Basically, all this sampling is a revolution in the music industry, um, and it's just participants revolutionizing participants pretty crazy idea but hopefully you understand it and i hope i've made sense and i hope you enjoyed the uh so long to talk that i've rambled on about thanks so much for your time and i'm jc belfie for ids 3250